scientists have long believed the universe is very, very old, nearly 13.8 billion years old is the common estimate. But now, this belief, based on years of observations and calculations, has been flung into question by a new study based on the James Webb Space Telescope's latest observations. The new shocking study revealed that our universe could be twice as old as current estimates believe it is. This challenges the dominant cosmological model and sheds new light on the so-called impossible early galaxy problem. But does it hold true, and was the Big Bang theory wrong? The James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, was built to revolutionize our understanding of the universe. Stationed 1.5 million kilometers away from earthly interference and chilled close to absolute zero by its tennis court-sized sunshade, the telescope's giant segmented mirror and exquisitely sensitive instruments were designed to uncover details of cosmic dawn never before observed. This is the scarcely probed era, no more than a few hundred million years after the Big Bang itself, in which the very first stars and galaxies coalesced. How exactly this process unfolded depends on exotic physics ranging from the uncertain influences of dark matter and dark energy to poorly understood feedbacks between starlight, gas, and dust. By glimpsing galaxies from cosmic dawn with the James Webb, cosmologists can test their knowledge of all these underlying phenomena, either confirming the validity of their best consensus models or revealing gaps in understanding that could herald profound new discoveries. Such observations were supposed to take time. Initial projections estimated the first galaxies would be so small and faint that the Webb telescope would find at best a few intriguing remote candidates in its pilot investigations. Things didn't go as planned, though. Since it first started sending back science data in mid-2022, the internationally funded, state-of-the-art JWST has been giving us images of distant galaxies that appeared to have formed and matured far earlier than our models predicted. Webb's Hall of Galactic Baby Pictures has proved more bountiful than most researchers dared to dream. Simply put, candidate galaxies in the early universe are popping up in numbers that defy predictions with dozens found so far. It's enough of a problem that some are calling it a challenge to our entire cosmic timeline. According to the standard model of cosmology, after the fiery Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, the universe cooled, and energy turned into matter, eventually coalescing during the first few hundred million years, forming the first generation of stars and galaxies. Astronomers thought they had a decent understanding of this process, but James Webb's initial results may suggest that stars and galaxies were forming far faster than anyone expected. The telescope had done nothing less, read the headlines, than break the universe and upend models of cosmic history. Subsequent data have ruled out some of the more dramatic findings, and new simulations can accommodate at least a few of the strange observations. But some bright, massive, and early galaxies continue to confound theorists, suggesting that understanding could shift in the coming years. According to Pramodha Nutrajan, a theoretical astrophysicist at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, no data at the moment has broken the universe, but there are interesting potential tensions emerging on different scales. Resolving these tensions will require researchers to revisit their fundamental assumptions about galactic evolution, and that could mean bringing new ideas to the forefront while leaving others in the cosmic dustbin. Prior to the launch of James Webb, no one knew if galaxies could ever form so early in the universe's 13.8 billion year history, at a time when matter was thought to still be sedately coalescing into the gravitationally bound clumps required to give birth to large groups of stars. As Gillenworth, an astronomer at the University of California, Santa Cruz, said in a press conference held by NASA to announce the peer reviewed validation of the first two candidates, and so we're wondering, do we really understand the early phases of the formation of these galaxies? This has posed a lot of questions for theorists. Chief among them is how exactly dark matter guided the emergence of galaxies. For the first few hundred years after the Big Bang, the cosmos was so hot that gravity could not pull normal matter together to form large protogalactic clumps. Yet, this was not an issue for dark matter says George Penaruya, a cosmologist at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, because dark matter does not interact via electromagnetic forces. Instead, gravity alone is this invisible substance's master, meaning that, in mere moments after the Big Bang, when primordial chaos otherwise reigned, 
gravity immediately began glomming together dark matter into large clumps known as halos. These dark matter halos are believed to have acted as gravitational sinks for normal matter, seeding the subsequent formation of galaxies in the early universe. The telltale motion of the stars they shepherd betrays their endurance to this day. Such halos still surround galaxies like our own, majestic, but invisible sculptors of the modern cosmos. James Webb's rapid discovery of early galaxies might be testing our understanding of how these halos form, perhaps suggesting they reached an immense bulk earlier than expected. One explanation might involve the very nature of dark matter itself. Theorists have found that simple treatments of dark matter, in which it only interacts with itself and normal matter via gravity, can accurately replicate large-scale cosmic structure. But nature has no guarantee of simplicity. In reality, dark matter could interact with itself because of an as-yet-unknown force, perhaps via a particle that's not in the current standard model of physics, possibly increasing the speed at which these halos grew and explaining how big, bright galaxies were able to arise so quickly. However, perhaps instead, these halos were simply more efficient at drawing in regular matter to feed star formation. I think this is probably telling us something about how stars form in dark matter halos so early on, Panaruya says. Today, our galaxy produces roughly one new star per year, but Castellano's paper suggests that star formation rates must have been at least 20 times higher in his and Naidu's two candidate galaxies. Another JWST-derived preprint paper posits that Milky Way galaxies could have arisen just a half billion years after the Big Bang a scenario that would demand star formation rates 10 times higher still than Castellano's estimates. But, according to Michael Bondekin, a cosmologist at the University of Texas at Austin, such outsized rates of star formation stretch the boundaries of what is physically possible. He says, if those values are correct, you'd need to have galaxies turning all their mass into stars and forming stars as fast as they could. Researchers have likened the possible early galaxy problem to flipping through someone's old photo album, expecting to find baby pictures, and seeing a full-grown adult instead. With a person, you might just conclude that they're older than you thought, but with early galaxies, you very quickly run into a problem with the age of the universe itself. For generations, people argued about whether the universe had always existed, whether it had a beginning, or whether it was cyclical, with neither a beginning nor an end. But starting in the 20th century and continuing into the 21st century, we not only drew a scientific conclusion to that question, the universe, as we recognize. It began with a hot big bang. But we were able to pinpoint precisely when the beginning occurred. The simplest and most straightforward way to measure the age of the universe is simply to look at the objects that are in it, stars, for instance. We have hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone and the overwhelming majority of the ancient history of astronomy was devoted to studying and characterizing these stars. It remains an active field of research today, as astronomers have uncovered the relationship between observed properties of stellar populations and how old they are. The basic picture is this, a cloud of cold gas collapses under its gravity, leading to the formation of large numbers of new stars all at once. These stars come in all different masses, colors, and brightnesses, and the largest, bluest, brightest stars burn through their fuel first. Therefore, when we look at a population of stars, we can tell how old it is by looking at what types of stars still remain and what classes of stars are completely gone. Our galaxy has stars of all different ages in it, but the measurements of any individual star will be riddled with uncertainties. The reason is simple, when we view an individual star, we see it as it is today. We cannot see or know what happened in that star's past history that may have led to its present condition. We can only view a present-day snapshot of what exists and have to infer the rest. You'll often see attempts made to measure the age of an individual star, but that always comes along with an assumption that the star didn't have an interaction, merger, or another violent event in its past. Because of that possibility and the fact that we only see the survivors when we look at the universe today, those ages always come along with massive uncertainties, one in the order of a billion years or even more. However, the uncertainties are much smaller when we look at large collections of stars. The collections of stars that form within a galaxy, like the Milky Way, open star clusters, 
typically contain a few thousand stars and only last a few hundred million years. The gravitational interactions between these stars eventually cause them to fly apart, while a small percentage last a billion years or even a few billion years. We have no known open star clusters that are even as old as our own solar system. Globular clusters, however, are larger, more massive, and more isolated, found throughout the halo of the Milky Way and most galaxies. When we observe them, we can measure the colors and brightnesses of many of the stars inside, enabling us, so long as we understand how stars work and evolve, to determine the ages of these star clusters. Although there are uncertainties here as well, there is a large population of globular clusters, even within the Milky Way alone, with ages of 12 billion years or more. How certain are we of these figures? Well, it's tough to say. While it's almost guaranteed that the oldest of these star clusters might be between 12.5 and 13 billion years old, there remain large uncertainties about the amount of time required for a star, right around the mass of our Sun, to begin its transition into a subgiant, followed by its transformation into a full blown red giant star. It could be 10 billion years, it could be 12 billion years, it could be some value in between. For years, many astronomers who worked on globular clusters argued that the oldest ones were 14, maybe 16 billion years old. But a shift in our understanding of stellar evolution now disfavors that interpretation of the data. Today, we can reliably conclude there's a lower limit to the age of the universe of around 12.5 to 13 billion years from the stars we measure. But that doesn't pin down the age, precisely. It's a good constraint to have, but to arrive at an actual figure, we'd like a better method. Fortunately, the universe gives us one. You see, Einstein's general relativity, for a universe filled with roughly even amounts of matter and energy everywhere and in all directions, like ours, gives a straightforward relationship between two quantities, the amounts and types of matter and energy present within the universe and how fast the universe is expanding today. This relationship was first derived all the way back in 1922 by Alexander Friedman, and the equations that enable us to derive how old the universe must be are known as the Friedman equations. It took us many years to measure the constituents of the universe, but a consensus picture has emerged. Observations ranging from the abundances of the light elements to the clustering of galaxies, to how galaxy clusters collide, to distant supernovae, to the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, all point toward the same universe. In particular, it's made up of 68% dark energy, 27% dark matter, 4.9% normal matter, protons, neutrons, and electrons, 0.01% photons, particles of light or radiation, and less than 0.4% of everything else, including spatial curvature, cosmic strings, domain walls, and other fanciful exotic components. This picture agrees with the full suite of observations that we have. You have to really cherry-pick your evidence very hard, overemphasizing measurements with large ambiguities, while simultaneously ignoring large swaths of data, to wind up with sets of values that vary significantly from this. So then, you might think that everything hinges on the expansion rate. If you can accurately measure that, you can simply do the math and precisely arrive at the age of the universe. Beginning in the early 2000s and ever since, the best data we have comes from the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB. First from the WMAP, and then from Planck, and as of July 14, 2020.